All right. Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are reading Angela Y. Davis, Women, Race, and Class. We are on the bottom of page 19. If black women bore the terrible burden of equality and oppression, if they enjoyed equality with their men in their domestic environment, then they also asserted their equality aggressively in challenging the inhuman institution of slavery. They resisted the sexual assaults of white men, defended their families, and participated in work stoppages and revolts. As Herbert Apotheker points out in his pioneering work, American Negro Slave Revolts, they poisoned their masters, committed other acts of sabotage, and, like their men, joined maroon communities and frequently fled northward to freedom. Drop the book one second. From the numerous accounts of the violent repression overseers inflicted on women, it must be inferred that she who passively accepted her lot as a slave was the exception rather than the rule. When Frederick Douglass reflected on his childhood introduction to the merciless violence of slavery, he recalled the floggings and torture of many rebellious women. His cousin, for example, was horribly beaten as she unsuccessfully resisted an overseer's sexual attack. A woman called Aunt Esther was viciously flogged for defying her master, who insisted that she break off relations with the man she loved. One of Frederick Douglass's most vivid descriptions of the ruthless punishments reserved for slaves involved a young woman named Nellie, who was whipped for the offense of, quote, impudence, end quote. There were times when she seemed likely to get the better of the brute, but he finally overpowered her and succeeded in getting her arms tied to the tree towards which he had been dragging her. The victim was now at the mercy of his merciless lash. The cries of the now helpless woman, while undergoing the terrible infliction, were mingled with the hoarse curse of the overseer and the wild cries of her distracted children. When the poor woman was untied, her back was covered with blood. She was whipped, terribly whipped but she was not subdued and continued to denounce the overseer and to pour upon him every vow epithet of which she could think. Douglas adds that he doubts whether this overseer ever attempted to whip Nellie again. Like Harriet Tubman, numerous women fled slavery for the North. Many were successful, though many more were captured. One of the most dramatic escape attempts involved a young woman, possibly a teenager, named Ann Wood, who directed a wagon load of armed boys and girls as they ran for their freedom. After setting out on Christmas Eve, 1855, they engaged in a shootout with slave catchers. Two of them were killed, but the rest, according to all indications, made their way to the north. The abolitionist, Sarah Grimke, described the case of a woman whose resistance was not so successful as Ann Wood's. This woman's repeated efforts to escape from the domination of her South Carolina master earned her so many floggings that, quote, a finger could not be laid between the cuts, end quote. Because she seized every available opportunity to break free from the plantation, she was eventually held prisoner in a heavy iron collar, and in case she managed to break the collar, a front tooth was pulled as an identification mark. Although her owners, said Grimke, were known as charitable and Christian family. This suffering slave, who was the seamstress of the family, was continually in their presence, sitting in the chamber to sew, or engaging in other household work with her lactated and with her lacerated and bleeding black, with her lacerated and bleeding back, her mutilated mouth, and heavy iron collar without, so far as appeared, exciting any feelings of compassion. Women resisted and advocated challenges to slavery at every turn. Given the unceasing repression of women, quote, no wonder, end quote, said Herbert Apotheker, quote, the Negro woman so often urged haste in slave plottings, end quote. Virginia, 1812, quote, she said they could not rise too soon for her as she had rather be in hell than where she was, end quote. Mississippi, 1835, quote, she wished to God it was all over and done with, that she was tired of waiting on white folks, end quote. One may better understand now a Margaret Garner, fugitive slave, who, when trapped near Cincinnati, killed her own daughter and tried to kill herself. She rejoiced that the girl was dead, quote, 
Now she would never know what a woman suffers as a slave. End quote. And pleaded to be tried for murder. Quote, I will go sinking to the gallows rather than be returned to slavery. End quote. And then I think I want to reflect upon a couple of things that was in those passages. I think the first thing is the first slave, Nellie, who even through all the the brutal, the brutality of enduring life as a slave, the brutality of being uh, uh, whipped by the overseer, she still continued to, as was quoted in this passage here, pour upon him every vow epithet of which she could think. And I think that as far back as we have been here as a speaking specifically of black people and uh, the descendants of, of the African slaves, uh, the power of speaking, the power of, of, of saying something. And when you have, you know, no other thing or no other option available to you, when you don't have the, the physical strength to overcome whatever the situation is, and you may not have the uh, financial capital needed to overcome whatever the situation is. The last line of defense is the exercising of freedom of speech, is the exercising of saying, and this isn't necessarily freedom of speech because she's being punished for it. And that has been the case for black people in general here is the concept of freedom of speech is not applied uh, in the same way manner to to us as it has to uh, other groups of people here and so I just think that the power again in in speech the power again in words uh, stands out and then I think the second story where they talk about uh, Ann Wood the slave who was had a tooth pulled out so people could identify her if she ran away who had been brutally beat the the family who did this were considered to be in the city and in the area that they were in a charitable family, a, a Christian, God-fearing family. And I think that that's something that has also been a commonality when it comes to uh, racial injustice issues is that people have who, ha- who are racist and who are prejudiced and, and biased and have all of these uh, colorists and anti-black ideologies they've been able to hide behind religion or hide behind uh charity you know they're they're, you know a perfect example is cow cow beavers and marge beavers they tried to hide their racism behind the fact that they uh try to stop people from being hungry or try to end hunger uh and so i just think that's another commonality of this uh white denial this american denial of racial injustice is uh hiding racism behind other acts of quote-unquote good deeds and things of that nature Uh, let's move on to the next page maroon communities composed of fugitive slaves and their descendants could be found throughout the south as early as 1642 and as late as 1864 these communities were quote havens for fugitives served as bases for marauding expeditions against nearby plantations and at times supplied leadership to planned uprisings end quote In 1816, a large and flourishing community was discovered. 300 escaped slaves, men, women, and children, had occupied a fort in Florida. When they refused to surrender themselves, the army launched a battle which lasted for 10 days and claimed the lives of more than 250 of the inhabitants. The women fought back on equal terms with the men. During the course of another confrontation in Mobile, Alabama, in 1927, men and women alike were unrelenting fighting, according to local newspapers, quote, like Spartans, end quote. Resistance was often more subtle than revolts, escapes, and sabotage. It involved, for example, the clandestine acquisition of reading and writing skills and the imparting of this knowledge to others. In Natchez, Louisiana, a slave woman ran a, quote, midnight school, end quote, teaching her people between the hours of 11 and 2 until she had, quote, graduated, end quote, hundreds. Undoubtedly, many of them wrote in their own passes and heads, excuse me, undoubtedly, many of them wrote their own passes and headed in the direction of freedom. In Alex Haley's Roots, his fictionalized narrative of his ancestors' lives, Kuta Kente's wife, Belle, painfully taught herself to read and write. 
By secretly reading her master's newspapers, she stayed abreast of current political events and communicated this knowledge to her sister and brother slaves. No discussion of the part played by women in resisting slavery would be complete without paying tribute to Harriet Tubman for the extraordinary feat she performed as the conductor for over 300 people on the Underground Railroad. Her early life unfolded in a manner typical of most slave women's lives. A field hand in Maryland, she learned through her work that her potential as a woman was the same as any man's. Her father taught her to chop wood and split rails, and as they worked side by side, he gave her lessons which would later prove indispensable during the 19 trips she made back and forth to the South. He taught her how to walk soundlessly through the woods and how to find food and medicine among the plants, roots, and herbs. The fact that she never once suffered defeat is no doubt attributable to her father's instructions. Throughout the Civil War, Harriet Tubman continued her relentless opposition to slavery, and even today she still holds the distinction of being the only woman in the United States ever to have led troops in the battle. Whatever the standards used to judge her, black or white, male or female, Harriet Tubman was indeed an exceptional individual. But from another vantage point, what she did was simply to express in her own way the spirit of strength and perseverance which so many other women of her race had acquired. This bears repeating. Black women were equal to their men in the oppression they suffered. They were their men's social equals within the slave community, and they resisted slavery with a passion equal to their men's. This was one of the greatest ironies of the slave system, for in subjecting women to the most ruthless exploitation conceivable, exploitation which knew no sex distinctions, the groundwork was created not only for black women to assert their equality through their social relations, but also to express it through their acts of resistance. This must have been a terrifying re excuse me. This must have been a terrifying revelation for the slave owners for it seems that they were trying to break this chain of equality through the especially brutal repression they reserved for the women. Again, it is important to remember that the punishment inflicted on women exceeded in intensity the punishment suffered by their men, for women were not only whipped and mutilated, they were also raped. It would be a mistake to regard the institutionalized pattern of rape during slavery as an expression of white men's sexual urges, otherwise stifled by the specter of white womanhood's chastity. That would be far too simplistic an explanation. Rape was a weapon of domination, a weapon of repression, whose covert goal was to extinguish slave women's will to resist and in the process to, demor to demoralize their men. These observations on the role of rape during the Vietnam War could also apply to slavery. Quote, in Vietnam, the U.S. military command made rape socially acceptable. In fact, it was unwritten but clear policy. End quote. When GIs were encouraged to rape Vietnamese women and girls, and they were sometimes advised to, quote, search, end quote, women, quote, with their penises, end quote, a weapon of mass political terrorism was forged. Since the Vietnamese women were distinguished by their heroic contributions to their people's liberation struggle, the military retaliation specifically suited for them was rape. While women were hardly immune to the violence inflicted on men, they were especially singled out as victims of terrorism by a sexist military force governed by the principle that war was exclusively a man's affair. Quote, I saw one case where a woman was shot by a sniper, one of our snipers, end quote, a GI said. Quote, when we got up to where she was at, excuse me, when we got up to her, she was asking for water, and the lieutenant said to kill her. So he ripped her clothes, they stabbed her in both breasts, they spread her eagle and shoved an e-tool, entrenching, up her vagina. And then they took that out and used a tree limb, and then she was shot. End quote. In the same way that rape was an institutionalized ingredient of the aggression carried out against the Vietnamese people, designed to intimidate and terrorize the women, Slave owners encouraged the terroristic use of rape in order to put black women in their place. If black women had achieved a sense of their own strength and a strong urge to resist, then violent sexual assaults, so the slaveholders, so the slaveholders might have reasoned, would remind the women of their essential and inalterable femaleness. In the male supremacist vision of the period, this meant passivity, acquiescence, and weakness. <clears throat> uh, and 
I think the first thing that comes to mind, uh, besides just the uh, inhumane nature of uh, rape being used as a, a tactic of control, a tool of control, I think about a, a book that I've begun to read, but I have not finished yet, uh, entitled Invisible No More. Uh, I, I, it was written by Andrea Ritchie, and it's about how police terrorism and mass incarceration specifically affect black women uh, and, and trans folks. And uh, But one of the things she's uh, that Andrea is highlighting uh, predominantly through the passages that I've read is how these things affect black women. And I think that going through and hearing the, the, the things that they, that black women were enduring during slavery and during doing slavery first brought to mind some of the things that they, the commonalities of the things that they endure now uh, with police terrorism and mass incarceration. I think, again, uh, it's important for, it's important to, when you think about the high propensity for sexual assault crimes and, and rape and all of these things in the culture and the society that we, not the culture, but in the society that we exist in today, uh, with uh, meet things like the Me Too movement that have gone on and just a, a hyper awareness that has uh, begun to ebb and flow when it comes to uh, the experiences of women in this, uh, women in America, specifically in the work workplace and the workforce. And I think that one of the things to point out here is that this is in the workforce. Uh, they are being used as uh, they are being seen as as laborers. They're not being seen as human beings or uh or extended family there this is their entire lives are created around work and created around labor and so i think that this is the original you know sexual assault in the workplace and i think one of the things to but what i'm trying to say is before we get back to reading is when we start thinking about the things that are prevalent in the society the evils and the uh, the wrong things that exist in our society that the negatives that are prevalent you can when you trace them back to the uh, their roots the majority of their roots are at the beginning of this country being built and are in uh, they can be traced back to the genocide of the indigenous people here and they can be traced back to the uh, uh, chattel slavery that was here and the things that were experienced by those groups of people and how that experience has uh, instead of uh, being acknowledged and addressed and then absolved uh, it has been ignored and it has flourished to the point where some of these things affect other groups besides just the, the subjugated marginalized groups that they uh, begin affecting at the beginning. Uh, and so those are just a few thoughts as we go through reading that. Let's pick back up. Virtually all the slave narratives of the 19th century contain accounts of slave women's sexual victimization at the hands of masters and overseers. Quote, Henry Bibbs' master forced one slave girl to be his son's concubine. M.F. Jameson's overseer raped a pretty slave girl. And Solomon Northrup's owner forced one slave, quote, Patsy, end quote, to be his sexual partner. Despite the testimony of slaves about the high incidence of rape and sexual coercion, the issue of sexual abuse has been all but glossed over in the traditional literature on slavery. It is sometimes even assumed that slave women welcomed and encouraged the sexual attentions of white men. What happened between them, therefore, was not sexual exploitation, but rather, quote, miscegenation, end quote. In the section of Roe, Jordan Roe, devoted to interracial sex, Genevieve Genovese insists that the problem of rape pales in relation to the merciless taboo surrounding miscegenation. Quote, many white men, end quote, the author says, quote, who began by taking a slave girl in an act of sexual exploitation, ended by loving her and the children she bore, end quote. Quote, the tragedy of miscegenation lay, quote, as a consequence. Not in this collapse into lust and sexual exploitation, but in the terrible pressure to deny the delight, affection, and love that often grew from tawdry beginnings. Genovese's overall approach hinges on the issue of paternalism. Slaves, he argues, more or less accepted the paternalistic posture of their masters, and masters were compelled by their paternalism to acknowledge slaves' claims to humanity. But since, 
In the eyes of the masters, the slaves is humanity was childlike at best. It is not surprising that Genovese believes he has discovered a kernel of that humanity in miscegenation. He fails to understand that there could hardly be a basis for, quote, delight, affection and love, end quote, as long as white men, by virtue of their economic position, had unlimited access to black women's bodies. It was as oppressors or, in the case of non-slave owners, as agents of domination, that white men approached black women's bodies. Genovese would do well to read Gail Jones's Corrid Corridora, a recent novel by a young black woman which chronicles the attempts of several generations of women to, quote, preserve the evidence, end quote, of the sexual crimes committed during slavery. E. Franklin Frazier thought he had discovered in miscegenation black people's most important cultural achievement during slavery. Quote, the master in his mansion and his colored mistress in her special house nearby represented the final triumph of social ritual in the presence of the deepest feelings of human solidarity. End quote. At the same time, however, he could not entirely dismiss the numerous women who did not submit without a fight. Quote, that physical compulsion was necessary at times to secure submission on the part of black women is supported by historical evidence and has been preserved in the tradition of Negro families. End quote. He cites the story of a woman whose great grandmother always described with enthusiasm the battles which had earned her the considerable scars on her body. But there was one scar she persistently refused to explain, saying, whenever she was asked about it, quote, white men are as low as dogs, child, stay away from them, end quote. After her death, the mystery was finally solved. She received the scar at the hands of her master's youngest son, a boy of about 18 years at the time she conceived their child, my grandmother Ellen. White women who joined the abolitionist movement were especially outraged by the sexual assaults on black women. Activists in the female anti-slavery societies often related stories of brutal rapes of slave women as they appealed to white women to defend their black sisters. While these women made inestimable con contributions to the anti-slavery campaign, they often failed to grasp the complexity of the slave woman's condition. Black women were women indeed, but their experiences during slavery, hard work with their men, equality within the family, resistance, floggings, and rape, had encouraged them to develop certain personality traits which set them apart from most white women. One of the most popular pieces of abolitionist literature was Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, a book which rallied vast numbers of people, and more women than ever before, to the anti-slavery cause. Abraham Lincoln once casually referred to Stowe as the woman who started the Civil War. Yet the enormous influence her book enjoyed cannot compensate for its utter distortion of slave life. The central female figure is a travesty of the black woman, a naive transposition of the mother figure, praised by the cultural propaganda of the period, from white society to the slave community. Eliza is white motherhood incarnate, but in blackface, or rather, because she is a, quote, quadroon, end quote, in just a little less than whiteface. It may have been Stowe's hope that the white woman readers of her novel would discover themselves in Eliza. They could admire her superior Christian morality, her unfaltering maternal instincts, her gentleness and fragility, for these were the very qualities white women were being taught to cultivate in themselves. Just as Eliza's whiteness allows her to become the epitome of motherhood, her husband, George, whose ancestry is also predominantly white, comes closer than any other black man in the book of being a, quote, man, end quote, in orthodox male supremacist sense. Unlike the domestic, acquiescent, childlike Uncle Tom, George is ambitious, intelligent, literate, and most important of all, he detests slavery with an unquenchable passion. When George decides, very early in the book, to flee to Canada, Eliza, the pure, sheltered house servant, is terribly frightened by his overflowing hatred of slavery. Quote, Eliza trembled and was silent. She had never seen her husband in this mood before, and her gentle system of ethics seemed to bend like a reed in the surges of such passion. Eliza, a practically oblivious to the general injustices of slavery, 
excuse me, Eliza is practically oblivious to the general injustices of slavery. Her feminine submissiveness has prompted her to surrender herself to her fate as a slave and to the will of her good, kind master and mistress. It is only when her maternal status is threatened that she finds the strength to stand up and fight. Like the mother who discovers she can lift an automobile if her child is trapped underneath, Eliza experiences a surge of maternal power when she learns that her son is going to be sold. Her, quote, kind, end quote, master's financial troubles compel him to sell Uncle Tom and Eliza's son, Harry, despite, of course, the compassionate and maternal pleas of his wife. Eliza grabs Harry and instinctively runs away, for, quote, stronger than all was maternal love, wrought into a paroxysm of frenzy by the near approaches of a fearful danger, end quote. Eliza's mother courage is spellbinding. When, in the course of her flight, she reaches an impassable river of melting ice, the slave catcher hot on her heels, she spirits Harry across. Quote, Nerve with strength such as God only gives to the desperate. She vaulted sheer over the turbid current by the shore and onto the raft of ice beyond. With wild cries and desperate energy, she leaped to another and still another cake, stumbling, leaping, slipping, springing upwards again. Her shoes are gone, her stockings cut from her feet, while blood marked every step. But she saw nothing, felt nothing, till dimly, as in a dream, she saw the Ohio side and a man helping her up the bank. End quote. The implausibility of Eliza's melodramatic feat matters little to Stowe because God imparts superhuman abilities to gentle Christian mothers. The point, however, is that because she accepted wholesale 19th century mother worship, Stowe miserably fails to capture the reality and the truth of black women's resistance to slavery. Countless acts of heroism carried out by slave mothers have been documented. These women, unlike Eliza, were driven to defend their children by their passionate abhorrence of slavery. The source of their strength was not some mystical power attached to motherhood, but rather their concrete experiences as slaves. Some, like Margaret Garner, went so far as to kill their children rather than witness their growth to adulthood under the brutal circumstances of slavery. Eliza, on the other hand, is quite unconcerned about the overall inhumanity of the slave system, had she not been threatened with the sale of her son, she would have probably lived happily ever after under the beneficent, beneficent tutelage of her master and mistress. The Elizas, if they indeed existed, were certainly oddities among the great majority of black women. They did not, in any event, represent the accumulated experiences of all those women who toiled under the lash for their masters, worked for and protected their families, fought against slavery, and who were beaten and raped, but never subdued. It was those women who passed on to their nominally free female descendants a legacy of hard work, perseverance, and self-reliance, a legacy of tenacity, resistance, and insistence on sexual equality, in short, a legacy spelling out standards for a new womanhood. And that brings us to the end of chapter one, Standards for a New Womanhood, and to the beginning of chapter two, the anti-slavery movement and the birth of women rights, women's rights. Uh, I think that from the, the main thing I take away from that first chapter is just uh, an added perspective on slavery, one that is centered on the experiences of, of black women during slavery. I think that one of the things that I've tried to do with each piece of literature that I've been reading over the past 18 months is uh, to treat each piece like a, a, a piece of a puzzle or a segment in a puzzle and just know that with each that no one book is going to be able to fill this puzzle in for me. But each book that I read, uh, as long as I'm uh, being able to comprehend the information, as long as I'm being able to retain the information, it will be adding another uh, it will be filling in a piece of that puzzle. And so I think that one of the pieces for me, because the fact that we live in a a patriarchal society, a misogynistic society. One of the pieces for me that uh, I'm still working on trying to fill in and is the experiences of women in this society, uh, specifically uh, black women and, and in general women of color in this society. And so I believe Angela Davis's uh, book, Women, Race, and Class is uh, perfect for that. I think that 
it's, it's, as difficult as it is to always hear about slavery when it is told from another perspective it is always informative and it also always goes to for me to again give a fuller spectrum of the uh of what slavery was of what slavery consisted of and i think that it needs to be a full spectrum to be able to for it to be understood and until all of these things that have happened in this country and the society are understood we will not be able to uh, begin to transform it and so i want to thank people for taking the time to listen to this episode it looks like it might take us about three episodes each to get through chapters i thought i was gonna make i thought this chapter was going this episode was gonna end up being a little bit longer but uh it wasn't uh, i think this should be it's a little bit thicker of a book than the other ones we've read but i think it's just the way the book's put together no that's the longest one we've read so far but it's gonna be worth it all right share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on uh, and remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to give people the opportunity to either begin or to further their journey on the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. All right.